Again, if, if I can react to the message from Mr. Malia, uh, who uh, wishes, says that he wishes to speak on item four on the agenda, it means on the current affairs debate. When we come to this item, Mr. Malia, please press the button request to speak, and then you will be put on the speaker's list, not earlier. That's when we come to this item on the agenda. Bon, bonjour à toutes et à tous. Si dans la salle tout le monde pouvait prendre place, comme ça on puisse débuter, je vous souhaite toutes et tous la bienvenue pour cette réunion de la commission permanente. Ce matin, on a eu bureau. Je peux vous annoncer que le bureau a été très bien. La réunion a été très diligente. Nous avons pu prendre des décisions. Euh, entre autres, l'adoption d'un rapport euh, dont le numéro est 18 qui permet les commissions de fonctionner. Ce que nous n'avons pas pu faire, c'est euh, adopter euh, un document qui est le document numéro 20 qui établit exactement les règles comme quoi et comment les commissions doivent être gérées. Et dès lors, nous n'avons pas non plus euh, su conclure sur les références de rapports en commission. Ceci dit, nous allons avoir la semaine prochaine, le 7 mai, un autre, une autre réunion de bureau de 9h30 à midi et nous aurons euh, une, une brève réunion de cette commission permanente aussi la semaine prochaine, le 7 mai, de midi à midi 30, seulement pour pouvoir adopter euh, la liste des rapports euh, et les références des rapports aux commissions. C'est une... Euh, autorité de la commission permanente, dont nous sommes bien obligés, euh, mis à part de, du bureau de la semaine prochaine, pour concrétiser euh, tous les éléments euh, de comment procéder à avoir les, les réunions des commissions dans les semaines à venir. Euh, nous avons dès lors aussi besoin d'une courte euh, commission permanente par après pour euh, décider sur les références des commissions. Je vous informe également que nous avons le temps jusqu'à 17h30, ce qui nous donne 2h30. Le temps de parole qui sera donné à toutes et tous, quand vous le demandez évidemment, sera limité à 3 minutes. Euh, ce matin, il était limité ce temps à 2 minutes. Je vous informe que du moment où vous êtes à vos 3 minutes, le micro va être coupé. Donc, ne vous étonnez pas que quand vous avez euh, des éléments à partager avec, avec la Réunion, qu'après 3 minutes, malheureusement, le micro sera coupé. Je ferai ce signe avec les deux mains pour si jamais vous n'avez pas vu que le compteur qui est en bas de l'écran euh, se rapproche à la fin. Donc, quand je fais ça, c'est un petit signe de courtoisie pour dire faites attention, il faut conclure parce que sinon euh, le micro va de toute façon euh, être coupé. Quand vous demandez la parole pour ceux euh, et celles et ceux qui n'ont pas été dans le bureau, voire dans la réunion d'hier de préparation, quand vous demandez la parole, vous avez la liste des intervenants, vous avez un petit bouton à droite pour demander la parole. Vous ne demandez la parole que sur le sujet qui est en cours, donc maintenant c'est l'introduction, euh, et veillez à ce que aussi bien votre micro que votre caméra soient ouverts quand vous avez demandé la parole. 
Euh, je vous demande également de rester dans une langue, de ne pas changer d'une langue à l'autre, euh, puisque ça donne des problèmes pour les interprètes. Dès lors, euh, j'ai mené la réunion ce matin en anglais et je la mènerai en grande partie cet après-midi en français. Euh, voilà pour ce qui est euh, l'introduction. Donc, pour être clair, la semaine prochaine, mais on y reviendra lors des points de cette réunion, euh, la semaine prochaine, le 7 mai, donc, on aura une réunion du bureau pour conclure sous les règles et la façon de conduire euh, euh, les réunions de commission dont on a décidé de principe que ça peut se faire. Euh, et oui, aussi sur ce bureau, on aura les références des rapports au comité et dès lors, on aura une courte réunion de la commission permanente la semaine prochaine, le 7 mai, pour confirmer euh, ces références des rapports. Ceci dit, en ce qui concerne les autres réunions, je vous informe déjà maintenant que la session plénière de juin 22-26 a été reportée. Elle est remplacée en partie par une réunion du bureau et de cette commission permanente lors de cette semaine. La date va vous être, va vous être communiquée et euh, le, la plénière de juin va se tenir avant la plénière d'octobre, ce qui veut dire que nous gardons bien deux Réunion plénière en 2020. Je résume, la semaine prochaine, bureau, bureau commission, par commission permanente le 7. En juin, bureau, commission permanente dans la semaine du 22 au 26 juin. La réunion de la plénière de juin est reportée dans le temps, ça pourrait être juillet, mais ça pourrait être septembre, en tout cas avant la plénière d'octobre qui de toute façon se tiendra aussi. Voilà, ceci dit, euh, comme introduction euh, à la réunion, je, de nouveau, je vous souhaite toutes et tous la bienvenue euh, et j'espère que, oups, j'ai poussé ma caméra, je suis désolé, j'espère que nous allons avoir une bonne réunion. De toute façon, les expériences que jusqu'à présent que nous avons eues ont été extrêmement positives. On en vient au point 2 euh, de notre agenda qui est l'examination de Prudential, je ne sais pas comment ça dit en français, vous savez, je suis habitué à mener des réunions en anglais, donc de temps en temps, euh, le mot juste m'échappe. Nous avons reçu donc euh, des credentials pour des nouveaux membres pour les délégations d'Azerbaïdjan, de l'Allemagne et de la Norvège, ils sont dans le document 15097. Est-ce qu'il y a des objections euh, en concernant ces credentials si jamais il y en a, je vous demande, de, alors faites signe en prenant la parole. Je n'en vois pas. Dès lors, les credentials ont été approuvées. Merci pour cela. On en passe maintenant à la, au point 3, modification de la composition des commissions. Donc, il y a évidemment des modifications de commissions qui sont le résultat de l'acceptation des credentials. Est-ce qu'il y a des remarques à faire concernant les changements proposés euh, sur les, les commissions. Je ne vois personne qui demande la parole. Dès lors, je considère que ces changements dans les commissions sont acceptés. On en revient au point 4 de notre agenda, euh, ce qui est une demande requête pour un, un débat d'actualité. Euh, il concerne l'article 53 de notre règlement. Euh, donc, les cinq groupes politiques euh, ont introduit euh, une demande de débat d'actualité concernant la réponse du Conseil de l'Europe euh, en ce qui concerne le COVID-19, euh, la COVID-19 pandémie, en ce qui concerne les droits de l'homme, la démocratie et l'état de droit. Ce matin, à l'unanimité, le bureau a donné son accord de, de, de commander, si vous voulez, de recommander chez nous d'avoir ce débat d'actualité sur le sujet que je viens de vous énoncer avec M. Jacques Maire qui serait l'intervenant premier pour ouvrir le débat. J'ai compris qu'il y avait quelqu'un, euh, M. le secrétaire général, qui voulait la parole sur ce point-là. Si tel est le cas, que la personne concernée demande la parole, sinon je ne serais pas en état de pouvoir le lui donner. Probablement, la personne en question voudrait intervenir, je suppose, lors du débat. Donc, je considère que non, 
je vois effectivement quelque chose. Voilà, Emmanuel Malinia. Vous avez la parole. Donc, ouvrez bien micro et vidéo. Vous avez la parole pour trois minutes. Apologies. I, I would like to intervene during the um, current affairs debate. Is this the time to do it so? No. Uh, you will have the floor during the current affairs debate. So thank you for, uh, for having you. Uh, once we get into the current affairs debate itself, now it is a decision to have it, which we have, can take now. Once we get into the current affairs debate, which will be number, number, number nine, I suppose, on our agenda that you have received, then you are entitled to ask for the floor the way you did it this way. Now I return to the request uh, for the uh, current affairs debate. Donc je retourne maintenant à la demande, excusez-moi de changer de langue, d'interprète. Euh, je retourne à la demande du débat d'actualité. Est-ce qu'il y a encore quelqu'un d'autre qui voudrait prendre la parole euh, se concernant? Je n'en vois pas dès lors la demande euh, de, du débat d'actualité. Euh, concernant les réponses du Conseil de l'Europe pendant la pandémie Covid-19, concernant les droits de l'homme, la démocratie et les droits est accepté. On le mènera sous le point 9 de l'agenda que vous avez reçu, et c'est Monsieur Maire qui va ouvrir le débat. Puis-je demander au chef de groupe de nous informer euh, qui va prendre la parole au nom des groupes On était mis, c'était mis d'accord ce matin que après Monsieur Maire qui prend la parole en premier. On aura cinq intervenants au nom de groupes, euh, à savoir les PP, Socialistes, Alde, Conservatives, UAL. J'ai le nom de Frank Schwab pour les Socialistes, j'ai le nom de Olivier Beck pour euh, l'Alde. Donc, si je pouvais, ou si quelqu'un pouvait faire un petit message au secrétaire général par la messagerie que vous avez qui prendra la parole au nom de IPP euh, et des conservateurs. Des conservateurs et des UL, ça nous aidera pour bien mener ce débat. Merci. Alors, on en vient à l'agenda. On doit euh, accepter formellement l'agenda qui vous a été envoyé. Est-ce qu'il y a des remarques euh, sur ce sujet Je n'en vois pas, donc l'agenda est accepté. Euh, je vous informe toutes et tous que quand vous me laissez faire, je vais aller vite. Donc, si vous allez... Si vous voulez me contredire, si vous voulez prendre la parole, soyez je, de grâce assez rapide, parce que j'ai l'habitude euh, de mener des réunions euh, tout azimut. Donc, donc, une fois que je démarre, je vais peut-être un tout petit peu trop. Donc, une fois de plus à toutes et tous, si vous voulez ajouter quelque chose au point, à un certain moment où vous opposez à la décision, je vous en prie de prendre la parole, de demander la parole. Voilà, je viens d'inciter quelqu'un de le faire, c'est très bien. Uh, Frank Schwab, vous avez la parole. Frank? Uh, no, no, it's just because of the the list of speakers, it's not, uh, it's not, I don't want to speak now. Okay, no problem. Bye bye, merci. Alors, on en vient au point 6 de notre agenda. Vous maintenant qui est donc la commission permanente à Paris le 6 mars. Euh, bon, vous avez là euh, les minutes, comme on les appelle, donc je suppose que c'est le rapport. Est-ce qu'il y a des, des éléments à soulever concernant le rapport J'ai M. Kiel, euh, j'ai Mme Petrastine sur la liste. So, Roger, so Roger, you have the floor. Camera's not working. So, oh, got it. Okay. Um, Rick, I'm sorry um, to come back to this, but it was raised at the Bureau this morning, and I think we ought to clarify this position. Uh, there was a dispute over the Italian presence or lack of it, at the meeting in the morning and the afternoon in Paris. Um, that was actually raised at the Bureau uh, prior to both of these meetings. The reason I know that is because Ian Little Granger wasn't able to be present, and I was present at the Bureau representing uh, the European Conservative Group. And the advice had been very clearly that anybody coming from an infected region should not attend. Uh, we discussed this at the Bureau. The, um, it was actually Jack uh, on behalf of the French who sought advice from the French government. And it was the French government acting, I believe, entirely properly 
that took the line of caution and decided that under the circumstances, the Italian representative from Lombardy should not be able to attend in the afternoon or, or, or to be allowed into the building. That wasn't in any way seeking to muzzle him or, or his country. It was simply a question of uh, prudence and, and the desire to make sure that insofar as is possible, people were kept safe. And I think it's indicative of how serious the situation was that, uh, as Madame Treese said this morning, following that um, meeting, although they weren't present, two members of the French Assembly did in fact test positive for COVID-19. And I understand, although I stand to be corrected, that a number of um, French, um, a number of Council of Europe um, civil servants uh, were unwell on, on their return from France. So it was, a, I mean, we are faced with a very serious situation and I think we all have to treat it seriously. But that was the background to what actually happened as opposed to what some people may have been told happened in, uh, in Paris. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Roger. We take well note of what you are saying, of what you have said. So we have the minutes, of course, the minutes, they reflect what has been said in those meetings, but I have to, I mean, I can confirm indeed what you are saying now. Uh, at no time it was the idea of aiming at a person in any way. Uh, maintenant, nous avons uh, Madame Petra Stinen qui veut la parole. Madame Petra, Mademoiselle Petra, je ne sais pas comment dire, vous avez la parole. Thank you, Rick. Thank you very much. And thank you all for being minutes, with us here. Petra. I know, I know. I have a point about uh, uh, the minutes. Um, I, I think I have been misquoted or maybe I have been misunderstood on the point of substitute and representatives. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't download the page because I wrote something else. But what I meant to say is that in the Netherlands, it would be helpful for the Netherlands delegation that in when we look at the works of the parliamentarians that we stress that the work of representatives and substitutes is equally important. Because some could interpret the term substitute as somebody who will replace the representative when the representative is not present. So the way it's phrased now is not correct, and I will send a correct uh, wording to the Secretariat to replace it in the minutes. Thank you. Merci Petra. C'est important d'avoir cette clarification. En effet, uh, les, 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 les substitutes and, and, and effective members, they have the same rights. Ils ont les mêmes. Oh là là, je suis en train de mélanger les langues, excusez-moi. Donc, on, on prendra en compte en compte ce que vous nous envoyez et on va l'ajouter à la réunion d'aujourd'hui. Est-ce que je peux demander à Horst de remettre le, 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 le petit truc en bas là, les chiffres à trois Parce qu'il était toujours en train de continuer pendant que Mme Steele était en train d'intervenir, elle n'avait pas ses trois minutes. Donc, est-ce que je peux demander de remettre à zéro ou à trois minutes euh, euh, Voilà, le, le, la petite montre. Merci Horst. Voilà. Donc, ceci règle, je suppose, avec les clarifications de Sir Roger et de Petra Steenen, le rapport de la réunion de la commission permanente à Paris le 6 mars. Oui, merci. Alors, nous avons le point 7. Euh, là, il s'agit donc de la plénière du 22 au 26 juin. Je vais donc répéter ce que j'ai vous ai annoncé ce matin, enfin ce matin, dans le début de la réunion, la session de juin, elle est reportée, elle se tiendra, la plénière, elle se tiendra avant la session plénière d'octobre, ce qui signifie que nous allons bien avoir deux sessions plénières encore cette année, cette session de juin reportée et la session d'octobre. Ceci dit, la semaine prochaine, le 7 mars, nous aurons un bureau de 9h30 à midi. Sur l'agenda, nous avons l'élément de régler comment les commissions vont pouvoir fonctionner, alors qu'on a déjà pris la décision principale qu'il peut. Deux, on aura les références aux commissions, aussi au bureau. Après le bureau de 9h30 à midi, on aura une courte session de la commission permanente, puisque c'est la commission permanente qui, elle, doit approuver les références des commissions. Et donc, de midi à midi 30, je dirais, on aura euh, donc la commission permanente aussi le 7, mars, euh, 7 euh, mai la semaine prochaine. Ceci dit, on aura aussi en juin, dans la semaine du 22 au 26, bureau et commission permanente, euh, où on pourrait traiter de, 
nombre de questions et entre autres aussi la question de comment et de quand avoir la plénière reportée de juin. Voilà, ça je peux vous communiquer, comme ça vous êtes pleinement informé de l'agenda. Ce qui nous amène au point 8, qui sont les références au comité. Donc, comme je viens de vous dire, euh, comme le bureau n'a pas pu statuer sur cette question, on statuera la semaine prochaine lors d'une courte réunion de la commission permanente après le bureau. Donc, ça, c'est le 7 mai, la semaine prochaine. Nous en arrivons alors au point 9 de notre agenda, qui est euh, le débat d'actualité. Euh, donc, je vous rappelle qu'effectivement, il y a quelques minutes, on a décidé d'avoir euh, ce débat d'actualité. La réponse du Conseil de l'Europe envers la pandémie COVID-19 concernant les droits humains, la démocratie et l'état de droit. Euh, le temps qui nous a été soumis, qui nous a été donné, si vous voulez, pour ce débat est d'une heure. Nous avons une heure pour ce débat. Euh, nous avons décidé que M. Maire peut ouvrir le débat. Par après, on aura cinq intervenants, un de chaque groupe politique. Donc, je vous demande de nouveau euh, d'envoyer un petit message au secrétaire général, comme quoi nous savons qui parlera au nom de quel groupe. Je sais que Frank Schwab le fera au nom de Socialistes, que Olivier Becht le fera au nom de Alde. Donc, les autres groupes, je vous demande de faire un petit message euh, au secrétaire général. Je vous rappelle également si vous voulez la parole, il faut le demander, vous serez sur une liste. Cette liste sera suivie, tout simplement. Euh, premier venu, première parole, mis à part, évidemment, les intervenants au nom du groupe. Et je vous rappelle aussi que vous avez exactement trois minutes. Vous avez la montre en bas sur votre écran. Du moment où vous atteignez les trois minutes, un peu avant, je vais faire ce petit signe pour vous rappeler que vous vous approchez aux trois minutes. Et malheureusement, à trois minutes, Horst, euh, il va couper le micro. Nous n'avons pas d'autre choix euh, que de faire cela, parce que sinon, il serait impossible de gérer la réunion. Ceci dit, je donne maintenant donc la parole à M. Jacques May. M. May, vous avez dix minutes et vous avez la parole. Jacques May. Merci, merci M. le Président. Euh, merci, chers collègues. Effectivement, nous proposons de tenir un débat d'actualité pour discuter des réponses apportées par les États membres du Conseil de l'Europe à la pandémie de Covid-19. Alors, je dis nous, je dis nous, car c'est assez rare, car c'est une proposition de débat qui a été soutenue par l'ensemble des présidents de groupes politiques de notre Assemblée. Et je veux donc en premier lieu remercier ici Tini, Alexandre, Franck et Yann, puisque ce genre d'initiative montre bien qu'il y a aujourd'hui une volonté commune très forte sous votre présidence, Rick, pour que notre Assemblée travaille, avance et assume son rôle de gardienne vigilante du fonctionnement de notre démocratie. Alors pourquoi est-ce qu'on a souhaité ce débat Évidemment parce qu'il est en pleine actualité, c'est le moins qu'on puisse dire, parce que nous espérons aussi qu'il permettra de partager des informations sur la législation et les pratiques nationales en la matière, mais nous souhaitons aussi que ce soit probablement la première étape de ce, que nous, ce qui nous attend dans les semaines suivantes, à savoir l'évaluation parlementaire des, rapports, des réponses apportées à la pandémie par rapport aux valeurs fondamentales de l'organisation. Donc le débat n'est pas ici fait pour tirer des conclusions fermes. Les rapporteurs auront ce travail dans les semaines qui viennent. Il n'est pas là pour accuser un pays ou un autre de quelque façon que ce soit. Et comme je me sens rapporteur euh, en compte commun de tous mes collègues, vous jugerez peut-être parfois mes propos un peu prudents. Euh, alors, Madame euh, Maria Boric nous a aidé ce matin. Hein, elle a fait une introduction extrêmement utile qui nous permet d'avoir un panorama et qui va nous faciliter la tâche. Alors, quel que soit le nom donné par les États à ces états d'urgence, ils impliquent à chaque fois, de manière importante et différente suivant les États, une augmentation des pouvoirs des gouvernements et une diminution à chaque fois des pouvoirs des parlements et du judiciaire. Ceci a une tendance qui est celle d'estomper les lignes de la séparation des pouvoirs et à déséquilibrer les freins et les contrepoids qui sont normalement à la base euh, de la démocratie. Les droits de l'homme, les libertés fondamentales sont également restreintes dans les limites prévues par le droit international, le droit européen et le droit constitutionnel. Dans certains pays, de graves préoccupations ont été exprimées 
quant à la proportionnalité de ses limitations et à l'instrumentalisation politique de la situation. Alors, j'aborderai en premier lieu les libertés publiques. La liberté de mouvement a été très restreinte à tous les niveaux, depuis le local jusqu'à l'international. Les mesures de confinement ont été accompagnées par la fermeture des écoles, des universités, des commerces, des bars, des restaurants. On a remis en cause le droit d'organisation de réunions. Ça a été en plus accompagné par des sanctions. Ce droit, cet obstacle à la liberté est probablement le premier obstacle euh, en matière de liberté publique. La fermeture a aussi concerné la fermeture des frontières et des aéroports et a totalement restreint la liberté de mouvement à l'échelle européenne. Alors, il en va de même également pour la liberté de réunion, qui est elle aussi largement remise en cause et qui, elle, peut impacter directement, effectivement, la situation euh, des euh, libertés publiques euh, et euh, des acteurs politiques. Dans certains pays, ce sont la liberté d'expression de la presse et de l'information qui ont été directement affectées. Des mesures ont été largement critiquées, comme par exemple en Hongrie, où une loi prévoyant la criminalisation des fausses informations a été votée, elle risque de restreindre la liberté d'expression et d'avoir un effet dissuasif sur beaucoup de journalistes dans certains pays, et notamment dans ce pays. Les mesures prises ont également affecté la protection des données et de la vie privée. À titre d'exemple, la Belgique, la République tchèque, la Slovaquie, l'Espagne ont adopté de nouvelles lois obligeant les fournisseurs à partager les données avec les autorités. En Autriche, en France, en Allemagne, en Italie, des annonces ont été faites selon lesquelles les opérateurs mobiles vont devoir partager des données de localisation anonymisées avec les autorités publiques afin de cartographier les mouvements et les concentrations d'individus. Enfin, des drones sont utilisés en Belgique, en France ou encore en Italie pour informer la population des zones interdites d'accès et contrôler le respect des règles de distanciation sociale. Le droit d'asile, quant à lui, a été suspendu dans la grande majorité des pays membres du Conseil de l'Europe et les inquiétudes importantes demeurent quant à la situation dans les centres d'accueil. On vient d'en parler ce matin pour la Turquie. J'en viens maintenant aux institutions démocratiques. Celles-ci sont également mises à rude épreuve. Une des conséquences du Covid-19, c'est le report des élections à différents niveaux dans de nombreux États membres. La tenue d'élections démocratiques n'est pas possible sans le respect de la liberté d'expression et de la presse, et la liberté de réunion et d'association à des fins politiques. Comme je vous l'ai dit, les mesures prises récemment ne garantissent pas ces libertés. Alors bien sûr, il n'existe pas de principe général interdisant la tenue d'élections pendant l'état d'urgence, mais il existe un risque que les principes électoraux fondamentaux ne soient pas assurés pendant cette période. La Commission de Venise nous invite à nous interroger sur les, décisions, les questions qui doivent entourer la décision euh, et, euh, relative au report d'une élection. Alors, je les reprends, elles ont été évoquées très rapidement, mais je voudrais en dire quelques-unes. Ce matin, par Mme Bourich, première question. La décision de reporter des élections est-elle prévue par la loi Une cour indépendante, éventuellement la cour constitutionnelle, exerce-t-elle un contrôle judiciaire sur cette décision Les partis politiques sont-ils pris en compte dans le débat sur le report des élections Si maintien des élections il y a, la campagne est-elle techniquement réalisable L'ensemble des candidats auront-ils les moyens de la réaliser dans de bonnes conditions La sécurité du personnel est-elle garantie ainsi que celle des commissions électorales. L'observation de ces élections pourra-t-elle organiser quand elle est prévue Autant de questions auxquelles les autorités doivent répondre avant de prendre la décision de reporter ou non les élections prévues pendant cette période de crise. À titre d'exemple, je souhaiterais attirer votre attention sur le cas du possible maintien des élections présidentielles en Pologne, qui a été aussi abordé ce matin. En tant que président du groupe AL2, j'ai exprimé mes préoccupations aux autorités polonaises, situation durant laquelle il est impossible d'organiser un débat politique sérieux nécessaire pour garantir des conditions de participation égales à chacune des forces politiques en présence. Que ce soit en Pologne, en d'autres pays, en France et ailleurs, la question du maintien des élections est cruciale afin de garantir la légitimité démocratique des représentants élus. Il ne faut donc pas prendre de décision hâtive. J'en viens enfin au troisième volet, qui est celui du principe du respect des principes de l'état de droit en période d'état d'urgence. C'est ici aussi l'art du compromis qui s'impose. Premièrement, le principe de l'égalité doit être respecté. L'action publique doit être prévue par la loi au sens large du terme. 
non seulement les textes législatifs adoptés par le Parlement, mais aussi les ordonnances prises par l'exécutif. Toute nouvelle législation d'exception doit respecter la Constitution et les normes internationales applicables. Deuxièmement, le régime de l'état d'urgence et les mesures d'urgence doivent être limitées dans le temps. Il n'est pas admissible que les pouvoirs exceptionnels de l'exécutif soient prolongés indéfiniment. De plus, toute disposition législative adoptée durant l'état d'urgence devrait aussi prévoir des échéances claires et fixées dans le temps, au-delà desquelles ces mesures exceptionnelles deviennent automatiquement caduques. Troisièmement, le principe de nécessité doit prévaloir dans ces situations exceptionnelles. Les mesures d'urgence doivent pouvoir atteindre leur but en altérant le moins possible les règles et les procédures normales du processus démocratique. Le pouvoir législatif peut être un temps délégué à l'exécutif, mais cela ne veut pas dire du tout que le premier donne carte blanche au second. Quatrièmement, bien que l'état d'urgence assouplisse certains contre-pouvoirs, les parlements doivent obligatoirement conserver le pouvoir de contrôle de l'exécutif. Ce contrôle doit pouvoir s'effectuer régulièrement afin de voir si les pouvoirs d'urgence accordés se justifiaient à ce, à ce moment. Et ici encore, nous observons une grande diversité dans l'attitude des gouvernements et des parlements. Et trop souvent, les mesures d'urgence sont validées par des majorités parlementaires, certes, mais ces mesures ne respectent pas les principes évoqués plus haut pour autant. En conclusion, je voudrais insister sur ce qui peut nous apporter ce débat. C'est le premier que nous tenons depuis le début de la crise. C'est un débat préalable qui a introduit les travaux des rapporteurs que nous venons de mandater ou que nous allons mandater sur les différents impacts de la pandémie sur nos sociétés. Je pense qu'il serait intéressant pour chacun d'entre nous, pour les présidents de commission et les futurs rapporteurs, de pouvoir être éclairés par une discussion libre sur deux aspects. D'abord, la façon dont nos États traversent cette crise et prennent en considération, bien ou moins bien, l'état de droit, la démocratie et les droits de l'homme, mais aussi les points de vigilance sur lesquels nous devons travailler et nous exprimer en tant que Conseil de l'Europe, en tant qu'Assemblée parlementaire, y compris sur des aspects très importants que je n'ai pas directement abordés, comme les aspects migratoires, les discriminations ou la gestion inclusive de la crise. Notre Assemblée peut jouer un rôle utile et important comme vigile des droits européens. Elle a toute sa place pour tirer une vision politique de l'après-crise, la, de et nous nous devons donc de participer à sa refondation démocratique. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Eh bien, pile sur dix minutes, ça, je ne l'ai jamais encore vu dans l'Assemblée. Je demande au, au président des groupes quand même de me communiquer ou de communiquer à M. Savicki, qui interviendra au nom de votre groupe. Je sais que c'est le cas pour M. Schwab, pour le groupe socialiste. Je sais que c'est le cas de M. Becht, pour le groupe AD. Je suppose que c'est le cas pour M. Cox, pour le UL. Euh, euh, Monsieur le secrétaire général, est-ce que vous avez les noms du IPP et des conservateurs Yes, President, you got them by Mr. Rhee. It's Mr. Pauci for the EPP group. So we have Mr. Schwaber, Mr. Pauci, Mr. Best, and Mr. Cox for the conservative group. We have no message uh, so far. Uh, they are kindly requested to ask for the people. We have the notification from Tini Cox. We now have a notification from Jan Niebler Granger, so I suppose it is him who would speak on behalf of the Conservative Group. We do not have the request for the floor from Mr. Ploche and from Mr. Schwabe, so if they could push the button request to speak, it would help to run the meeting correctly. Thank you, President. Merci. Donc, je demande expressément pour que Mr. Schwabe, Mr. Becht, euh, demande la parole, parce que sinon je ne peux pas vous le donner. Est-ce que M. Pojcik a demandé la parole euh, Bec, je le vois maintenant. Alexandre, je le vois maintenant. Donc, on va débuter comme il se faut avec euh, le président du groupe IPP, Alexandre Pojcik. Vous avez la parole. Alexandre, vous avez la parole. Alexandre Pojcik. Uh, thank you, uh, President. Uh, warm uh, welcome uh, to everybody who joined the meeting. Uh, Yes, indeed, I, uh, I can confirm that uh, it was a unanimous uh, decision taken by uh, uh, presidential committee to have this topic uh, for a current debate. Uh, I strongly believe that uh, any misuse of the pandemic situation to put uh, exaggerated restriction on functioning of democratic institution 
shall be detected and pointed and condemned. We go through unusual time, very difficult time, and uh, many countries has to take, had to take uh, a special measures, but this should not serve to concentrate more power in hands of those who are already holding this power. And uh, I would like to thank uh, to Jacques to take uh, this, uh, 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 the, the lead and uh, to present uh, and uh, the present as it was presented uh, this, um, this, uh, this uh, item. I want to put your uh, attention to the subtitle COVID-19 impact on democracy, including electoral process. Yes, indeed. Uh, we face in Poland, uh, Poland was mentioned, a uh, big problem because according to the pools, something like 80% of the population is against uh, to hold uh, those elections right now. And uh, it was absolutely impossible to campaign during last last five uh, 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 five weeks to all the candidates except the president, who of course, as a president, has uh, all possible uh, means uh, to lead the campaign. And also, I. Uh, I put your attention uh, to the problem of the violence against women, including domestic violence. Yes, indeed, when speaking to colleagues from different countries, and uh, this is unfortunately also the Polish uh, problem, uh, we detected uh, that uh, staying at home, it, uh, it, uh, it has huge impact uh, on this violence. Thank you very much. President, microphone. President, microphone. Oui, désolé. Don, merci, Alexandre. Nous venons maintenant au représentant du groupe socialiste et son chef de groupe, Monsieur Schwab. Frank, vous avez la parole. Thank you very much, dear President. Uh, dear colleagues, for sure, it's a very extraordinary situation for all of us. Um, and in all the countries, we have to fight against this uh, COVID-19, the coronavirus in the same way and it's a challenge for all of us and i would like to underline that it's important for us as an organization that we proceed to work and we take an important decision that we will do so in the morning in the bureau all of us should know that we uh, are an organization in work and um, there are some who think ah, maybe there are some democratic problems now when we proceed but uh, some of them uh, are some who don't uh, take very much care on democratic rights um, in their own country. So at the, again, I would like to underline that the vast majority of our organization would like to proceed and to, to discuss about the values of human rights, democracy and uh, rule of law. For sure, there are the challenges for all of the countries, like Jacques Mer, who I thank you very much for his introduction, uh, uh, what, what he mentioned. It's um, a difficult time, but I would like to underline the European Convention on Human Rights stands still like it is and all the countries have to know it and all the countries discuss it in a democratic way even in our country in germany we discuss in public very controversial about uh, some issues about the question if the church should open if the kindergarten should open if the schools should open if we can have demonstrations and things like this if we can have a track and trace app and what are the conditions um, but uh, this uh, is going on in a democratic way and there are some court decisions who correct uh, the decisions uh, at the end uh, of the government but i have to say there are unfortunately some countries who misuse the situation and uh, there are some examples there's the example of hungary where it's uh, misuse when i i see misuse when we we don't have a, a limitation on uh, not uh, have giving uh, not, not limiting uh, the the possibility for the prime minister to act instead of the parliament. We have a misuse, I think so, in Turkey, where we have a kind of uh, 
um, yeah, uh, the situation where people are out of the prison, but a lot of them are really, really, really criminals. Those one who I would call political prisoners, they are still in. They are still in, and they are very uh, under in, in a very difficult uh, situation. We have the situation in Poland where we will see maybe presidential elections under not uh, conditions we can accept in our organization. We have the situation in Russia where the Chechen so-called leader uh, uh, discuss if uh, he should use a death penalty against uh, some persons and so on. So because of this, we have to speak about it. We need reports about it and we need uh, rapporteurs and chairs of the committees who use the power now. Thank you very much. Merci, Franck. Nous avons maintenant le représentant du groupe ALDE, Olivier Becht. Vous avez la parole, Olivier Becht. Vous m'entendez Très bien. Euh, merci, Monsieur le Président. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Euh, je voudrais, euh, bien sûr, me joindre à l'initiative qui a été proposée par Jacques Maire et, et dire qu'évidemment, au sein du groupe Aldé, nous partageons l'ensemble de ces préoccupations. Euh, je voudrais euh, également dire que la crise euh, que nous sommes en train de vivre est évidemment un choc sanitaire, mais ce sera également un choc économique et social qui va euh, engendrer, on le voit déjà dans certains pays, euh, des tentations euh, à la fois euh, de... Euh, de restauration de pratiques contraires à la démocratie, aux droits de l'homme, voire parfois à l'état de droit. Mais c'est également un sentiment qui peut se développer de repli nationaliste. Or, on le sait, le repli nationaliste peut également engendrer un mouvement de déconstruction de l'Europe. Et donc, la question sera aussi de savoir comment est-ce que nous allons pouvoir exister nous-mêmes euh, en tant euh, qu'institution euh, dans ce contexte, dans un contexte qui sera également donc une crise géopolitique. On voit bien les États-Unis qui eux se replient euh, sur eux-mêmes, qui sont en train de sortir progressivement euh, du jeu du multilatéralisme. C'est également la Chine qui profite de la crise pour avancer euh, ses pions. Et donc euh, le Conseil de l'Europe, comme l'Europe tout entière, va devoir se positionner euh, dans ce jeu et ça va devenir évidemment euh, un, enjeu, euh, un enjeu important. Euh, pour notre institution, ça veut dire que bien sûr, il faut poursuivre les travaux qui étaient les nôtres et je remercie euh, au nom du groupe ALDE, euh, le secrétaire général, euh, le président, euh, euh, d'avoir bien voulu assurer la continuité de nos travaux par les formes qui sont les nôtres aujourd'hui. Mais ça veut dire aussi qu'il faudra peut-être, au-delà des travaux qu'on était en train de, de faire, notamment par exemple sur l'intelligence artificielle, investir des domaines nouveaux. Je pense notamment au droit à la santé, qui va devenir une préoccupation importante de la part des Européens dans l'après-crise. Il va falloir se, se positionner, ce n'est pas impossible, euh, dans nos statuts d'ailleurs, euh, la question de la recherche scientifique est, est clairement prévu par les, par les statuts. On a des exemples très concrets à travers la pharmacopée. Donc, ce sont des champs qu'il faudra peut-être également euh, envisager euh, d'investir. Et euh, je voudrais terminer en disant qu'on a vécu ces dernières années une crise politique au sein du Conseil euh, de l'Europe. On vit aujourd'hui euh, cette crise économique, euh, sanitaire, euh, sociale. Euh, C'est aussi l'occasion de se réinventer. Euh, comme le Conseil de l'Europe a joué un rôle important dans l'après-guerre, après 1945, lors de sa fondation en 1949, eh bien, il peut peut-être aujourd'hui jouer un rôle important dans la crise de l'après, enfin dans l'après Covid 19. Voilà ce que je souhaitais dire au, au nom du, du groupe. Merci. Merci Olivier. Nous en venons maintenant à l'intervenant du groupe conservateur, uh, Ian Le Granger. Ian, you have the floor. Uh, Mr. President, thank you very much. And I do apologize. I was a little bit late coming on. I think that this crisis has made us all sit up and just think really what does matter in our lives and why things matter. And I do think that other countries, other than the ones mentioned by Frank and others, need to be taken into consideration because all of us have had to suspend democracy to an extent. We've had no choice. This is a unique time. Other than wartime, we've never had to do this. And even the flu pandemic of 1918, this was not a necessary situation that we found ourselves in. 
and this is worldwide but we've got to be honest about it and all of us have got to stand up and be counted i'm very concerned about certain countries not just the ones mentioned but ones closer to home and i look at the where the council of europe sits the french we have riots we have police beating people up in the streets we have dare i say it from a, a group which is meant to be liberal are they the most illiberal dare i say it in western europe uh, that has taken a stance which seems to me not only suspending democracy but bending bending the rights of the humans and uh, their citizens to almost breaking point having dare i say id cards to go out and walk your dog that's a novelty i think there's a lot we've got to look at and it's just not dare i say the favorite three countries that come up every single time it is a wider a wider view and the points about america and china are right but europe quite honestly has never stood up to either america or china and therefore why would we start now the point is we have to try but unless we have a united front which i think is going to be very hard to put together mr president i find it hard to know how we're going to do that we haven't got the mechanism for it we can make dare i say pompous comments and write hundreds of reports will they listen no of course not if you ask an american about council of europe i suspect they scratch their heads probably the same as the chinese but the point is this we have to look at across europe yes we have the ability to bend the court of human rights and the ruling and the convention but i do think that as a lot of us need to look very closely in the mirror and say did we act correctly in this and this will come back and back again mr president and i thank you for giving me time to speak merci ian euh, nous avons maintenant euh, sur la liste euh, des euh, représentants du groupe UL, j'ai Tini Cox. Tini, vous avez la parole. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, and may I, as the last speaker on behalf of the political groups and uh, on behalf of the United uh, Left, express our condolences to the relatives and friends of all those who have passed away during this crisis. I express my gratitude, Mr. President, to the numerous brave healthcare workers and others in the public sector fighting against the virus and protecting our citizens. I pay tribute to our citizens who are showing a tremendous solidarity amongst themselves as they realize that organized solidarity is now the only civilized way out of this horrible health and social crisis. Last week, the United Nations Secretary General warned the world that this crisis is fast becoming a human rights crisis, a risk that it could provide a pretext to adopt repressive measures for purposes unrelated to the pandemic. Therefore, I welcome the statement of you, Mr. President, that the European Convention of Human Rights is a checklist for hard times, which with clear red lines, which authorities in our member states are not allowed to cross. I agree with our Council of Europe Secretary General that we should not let the virus, which is destroying many lives and much else, destroy our core values and free societies and therefore we must we have to stand up when and where we notice abuse and misuse for example in Hungary Turkey and Poland the unlimited powers given in Poland to the government co counter the fundamental rule of democracy an indefinite and uncontrolled state of emergency cannot guarantee that basic principles of democracy will be observed as our Secretary General states the exclusion from new amnesty laws in, in Turkey of politicians, journalists, academics, civil servants and others is a blatant violation of the European Convention on Human Rights. I call for an urgent legal steps to redress the discriminatory effects of the Turkish criminal enforcement law. And Mr. President, the attempts of the Polish authorities to organize elections under conditions that cannot be called free and fair harm the democratic rights of the Polish citizens, as our Secretary General told us this morning. Mr. President, I therefore hope that the, the Senate Committee shall call upon the authorities of Turkey, Poland and Hungary to refrain from any further deviation from our shared values and urgently review their recent decisions which harm the interest of their citizens and harm the interest and the goals of the Council of Europe as such. Dear colleagues, Mr. President, we have entered into a terra incognito with great dangers for our citizens and our societies. More than ever, we should rely on our anchors to keep our continent stable in these terrible times. The rule of law, human rights, and democracy. Therefore, I dis disagree very much with Ian Littlegrange. We should not suspend democracy. This is the time for democracy. Let us stick together 
and uphold our common standards and values. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Merci, Tini. Je vois maintenant sur la liste des intervenants consécutivement euh, Petra Bayer et d'autres collègues, comme les chefs de groupe ont eu leur intervention. Nous suivons maintenant la liste des intervenants comme ils se sont inscrits. Euh, la première personne sur la liste, c'est Petra Bayer. Petra, vous avez la parole. Ha. At least you can hear. Yeah, yeah, no, can hear. It's not easy. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, of course, all of us are affected by the virus, and some are even more affected by this virus. I think about sick people, people with, living with HIV AIDS, people living with disabilities or elderly who really struggle to access to the correct healthcare services, including sexual and reproductive health rights services. Um, and I also think about children uh, who maybe have not access to education because their parents lack the possibilities for ICT equipment, which would make distance schooling possible. I also think, and it was, uh, thank you very much, it was mentioned um, about women who become victims more than usually victims of gender-based or domestic violence, uh, more often due to the situation that they are stuck at small homes with frustrated men. Um, violent men. Um, I also think about members of ethnic minorities uh, or ethnic language minorities who lack access to information uh, about how they could pro pro uh, keep away from the virus and how they could protect themselves. So I think that we really have to think very broad and, and include all these peoples in our considerations in, and our political practices. And where I also think that we as Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe should get active is in this thinking, which was also content of a decision taken by the um, United Nations General Assembly that wherever a medicine or a vaccination is developed with uh, public subsidies, successfully developed, it's really important that we have a look on that, that everybody has access to this new medicine, everybody has access to the vaccination uh, before there is a patent on that and before uh, um, pharmaceutical industry starts making profits on that, first all people have to have access to this medicine, especially then when it's uh, developed with subsidies. So I think um, on the one hand, we, when we think of uh, people who can be affected by the virus, we really have to think very broad and we really should enshrine everybody um, in the possibilities to be beneficiary of development and of new um, ideas how to tackle this issue. Thank you very much. Merci. Le, la prochaine intervenante, c'est Dame Cheryl Gillen. Vous avez la parole. Thank you very much, President. Can I also thank Jacques and particularly associate myself with the remarks made by Tini Cox uh, to send our condolences to all those that have lost their lives and their families in this terrible pandemic. The pandemic is no doubt having a profound effect on the economic and social and political lives, not just of our member states, but the whole world. It is a world crisis and we must not add another casualty uh, to those that have already lost their lives in the shape of democracy. Unfortunately, we have to start the post-mortem on democracy um, before it's died in order to find the cure. If you like, we have to look for the vaccination that is going to help democracy survive. On the political committee and looking at it from my perspective and our perspective, we have started to gather information on what has been happening in our member states. Um, you know, President, I invited uh, members to contribute and we've also started to gather information uh, through the European Centre for Parliamentary Research and, Demo and, and uh, Documentation. I'm pleased to report we have already more than 30 contributions uh, through the ECPRD and many contributions from our colleagues and I thank them for it. It does show people's willingness to provide information and to take part in, in what is 
um, effectively going to provide the body of information for future reporting. Um, I have to say that we're going to face some very hard new challenges that we are going to have to look at in the Council of Europe. I think particularly the challenges of people's freedoms when tracking and tracing starts to become uh, something that is common, when perhaps compulsory immunization is proposed when we have a vaccine, when we look at the use of personal data, and also when we look at those people that have been disproportionately affected uh, by this uh, uh, coronavirus crisis. Um, I therefore think that it is very important that the Council of Europe has those mechanisms to look at these issues in a very open and transparent fashion. We all know that the amount of trust uh, and citizens' trust in all our institutions is challenged on a daily basis. And we need to ensure that the transparency of the Council of Europe and the public debate that we have actually contributes to improving people's trust in our institutions. I think that we have played in the past major roles in bringing together the parliaments of a democratic Europe and in strengthening democracy at home and abroad. And I know that we should be providing this platform for developing a joint response to the problems that all our societies are facing. Merci, Dame Charles. J'ai l'impression que le petit signal fonctionne. Merci pour cela. La prochaine, le prochain collègue sur la liste, c'est M. Samad Seydo. Samad, vous avez la parole. Nice to see you, Mr. President, Mr. Wojciech, dear friends, dear colleagues. I welcome everyone. It's nice to see you from Baku. And uh, before the uh, presenting information about what is going on within this war, and unfortunately we faced, uh, I want to bring to your attention uh, some very important facts which had happened in Azerbaijan and which directly related to the human rights and democracy and rule of law. Uh, a couple of days ago, the Supreme Court of Azerbaijan uh, to equip Ilgar Mamadov and Rasul Jafarov. Uh, I think this uh, acquittal will open new opportunities to enhance cooperation between Azerbaijan and Council of Europe. You know, for a long period of time, this problem uh, created a lot of uh, headaches, obstacles between us. And uh, we did it despite of the fact that we are in the middle of the fighting against uh, this new coronavirus. At the same time, taking into account this a problem with uh, human rights within the prisons. The president pardoned those who over 65 years, which is really very important. And the total number of this person more than 176 persons. Returning to the uh, subject of coronavirus, we did everything which uh, uh, World uh, uh, Health Organization recommended at uh, Azerbaijan. We created the special uh, task force under the cabinet of the ministers and of course we closed everything bodies schools factories but one institution despite of all these difficulties is still working and during this pandemic period of time the parliament has been operating and uh, the next meeting for example will be tomorrow and even during the all these difficult uh, time we held the meeting of the parliament and within the discussion within the parliament we adopted the special law concerning the internet and possibility to access to internet more than we have done and we have in the past which is really very important unfortunately uh, situation is not so easy like 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 it seems but in azerbaijan thanks god everything is going well in the right direction we have only 23 deaths and still 476 persons under uh, the treatment and the total number of those who affected with this virus 1766 but uh, as i said the uh, situation is not so bad and i wish to everybody health and strength in this fighting against evil thank you merci zama j'ai sur la liste maintenant zob vous avez la parole zob 
pour là. Salt, vous avez la parole. Apparemment, nous avons perdu Zolt. Je vous demande, Zolt, de vous réinscrire sur la liste. Malheureusement, vous serez en dernier, mais j'essaierai de vous donner la parole auparavant. OK. On en arrive à Titus Corlatean. Euh, Titus, je vous donne la parole. Hello, Hello Mr. President, uh, colleagues. Uh... It's good to see you even uh, from the distance. I think it's extremely important that we have started the debate today on this subject. And uh, I have the personal feeling that uh, after the end, uh, at the end of the state of emergency in different uh, member states, uh, the Council of Europe and our assembly will have a extremely complex, difficult, but uh, essential uh, task uh, to make the assessment at the end of what happened and uh, to take serious conclusions and to make strong recommendations. Because, it, I'm trying to explain briefly, if someone uh, will uh, be interested to feel the taste of the absolute power exercised within a democratic state, this is the right moment. And unfortunately, we, th we see things uh, uh, happening uh, in these uh, terrible uh, circumstances in different member states, including in my, my own uh, country, uh, Romania. Uh, trying to, to underline the fact that precisely in these circumstances, the role of the national parliaments uh, remain uh, essential. Uh, in our case, in Bucharest, for instance, and I, I'm part of those who uh, strongly worked, hardly worked, uh, to keep the, uh, the operational uh, capacity of the parliament uh, functioning uh, all the time through also online uh, procedures, now going step by step back to the physical presence within the parliament. I think it was an, is essential to have a, a clear voice and role of the parliament exercised in this uh, uh, state of emergency situation because when you have uh, um, um, for instance, in the architecture of power, uh, political power in a state, president and government uh, belonging to the same political power, it doesn't mean what is the political power and uh, power uh, color. And uh, you have a, a set of uh, strong competences given to this uh, uh, power. Uh, uh, temptations uh, are arriving. You see concrete measures going beyond the red line. Uh, and uh, uh, raising very serious issues of uh, 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 democracy and uh, rule of law and uh, protection of uh, human rights. This is why we adopted in the parliament two uh, decrees, uh, establishing the, la the second one, establishing clear safeguard clauses uh, related to the uh, limitation of uh, which is happening. Uh, but going beyond the red line as concerned the fundamental uh, human rights and the liberties, freedom of expression and freedom of information, we have serious problems here. I, I can tell you uh, already sites closed down without prior notification, without uh, asking to remove, for instance, one uh, article, if this is a problem, one but extremely critical constantly to the president, that was shut down. So I will end and I will send, uh, I don't know if I still have the time because I see the time going, no. So I will send in a written uh, form uh, to the rapporteur some concrete, uh, very concerning things. Thank you. Merci, Titus. Je vois que Zolt s'est réinscrit tout en bas de la liste. Donc, Zolt, je vous donne la parole maintenant. Zolt. Thank you very much. Great. Do you hear me? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would like uh, first to uh, uh, congratulate all those in our countries who are fighting the pandemic. It is a terrible fight and I am really impressed uh, in the, uh, on the performance of all those in the front. Secondly, uh, we have exchanged a letter with you, uh, Rick. Uh, thank you very much for your response, uh, quick response. And I would like to underline that uh, uh, even uh, some people before you have mentioned that the Hungarian measures would be disproportionate. Uh, I would draw your attention that there have been quite a few judgments 
on the Hungarian solutions in the past couple of weeks. Uh, last probably was the one uh, from Vera Jourova, the commissioner for uh, justice matters in the European Commission, uh, who made it very clear that the Hungarian law has no any counter uh, democracy and human rights characteristics. And uh, uh, our friend from uh, Germany, Frank Schwabe, I would draw your attention to the uh, speaker of the Bundestag. Mr. Schäuble had the same kind of statement. So I th think what is the most important now is to have a thorough analysis in our countries. And then uh, we should avoid making early judgments before uh, our analysis. Uh, our countries are in a fight and uh, we should respect each other to the level that we find important that proportionality is kept the Hungarian law, in my opinion, is doing that. The uh, timeline, it may be a question, but I would like to draw your attention that there are many countries who do not have clear timelines, just saying that until the pandemic lasts, but as soon as the pandemic lasts, it is over. And at any time, in any case, the parliament uh, at any time has the right in Hungary to repeal any measures uh, and all the measures at the same time. So, dear colleagues, uh, I think it will be important to have this report, important to have the discussion, and uh, vitally important to respect each other and to help each other in this very difficult time of our life. Thank you very much for your attention. Merci, Zolt. Uh, je continue sur la liste des intervenants. J'ai maintenant Ingert Schau. Vous avez la parole, Ingert. see you and to hear all my colleagues uh, uh, in the Council of Europe and uh, see you here also from, from Norway and Oslo. I think also the coronavirus is putting uh, us all to, to the test. The capacity and also the capability of our health care systems are being put on the test as, it, as is the patience and perseverance of our people. And we, as politicians, are being put to the test at all. Uh, how we are democratically elected representatives are managing uh, the ongoing crisis without compromising and democratic principles, human rights and the rule of law is being tested now. Uh, and I'm not sure that we uh, are all passing. Uh, since March the 13th, when exceptional measures were introduced in Norway, the Storting has implemented several measures. This is in order for us to be able to continue our work uh, as elected representatives and ensure that our parliament functions uh, as the legislative body it is, and that we continue uh, our core tasks of parliamentary oversight. Uh, as in uh, many other member states, the Norwegian government introduced a bill for a temporary law which would grant in authority a uh, grant it it uh, authority to fast track regulation necessary to deal with the ongoing crisis uh, and throughout the bipartisan efforts the storting ensured that the time limit of the law was reduced from 6 to 1 months and the government must now send their proposals as soon as possible to the storting and if one third of the parliamentarians oppose, it has to be withdrawn. This safeguard was not in the original bill from the government. These are, I think, also examples of how the Storting fulfilled its responsibility to ensure just that fundamental democratic, democratic principles are safeguarded. Uh, and I'm a little bit proud of how my parliament was able to deal with this difficult situation and you know in Norway we have a kingdom and and the government has to go to the to the king once a week but during this situation they have passed bill because of that limit of one month two times uh, a week and then the bill come to the parliament and we have to make our duties here so thank you from Norway and Oslo and we have also sent a uh, a letter that describes how we also see the future, how to organize the Council of Europe. Thank you. 
Merci beaucoup. Nous avons sur notre liste des intervenants le prochain, la prochaine Lisa Yasko. Lisa, vous avez la parole. Um, hello, dear colleagues, and greetings from Kiev. Uh, it's great to see everyone and to know that we are working in this format. That's great news. Um, and in our conversation, in our discussion, what I want to uh, highlight, uh, I think in the discussion that we have now, it's important to keep the balance uh, about how member states actually keep the balance between monitoring the situation and granting access to the healthcare um, healthcare services and also without too much of uh, politicization and i'm talking here that everyone should be granted an equal right to have uh, access to health care but what happens to people who are homeless or with roma communities what happens to them or people who are in occupied territories or are in prisons do they have this um, rights for for this medical treatment um, what is alarming that the countries, the member states who misuse this power right now um, and use sometimes uh, the situation for the political purposes, that actually what is alarming that the lies and the fakes about pandemic is spreading and I think there should be uh, something important that we could do together to uh, fight uh, fake news and uh, fight more for truth. And of course, I want to mention the situation in Donbass and in occupied uh, territories. Um, the Red Cross representatives uh, confirmed that uh, the situation, the humanitarian situation because of the pandemic has only worsened. And unfortunately, people there cannot um, access uh, medical treatment because the healthcare infrastructure is ruined. And unfortunately, aggressor has not uh, built uh, like the medical infrastructure that pro would provide a uh, decent uh, treatment to everyone and if we talk about the prisons in uh, Crimea also a number of international organizations reported that it's not possible to visit illegally detained people there which of course uh, deprives them from the right uh, for receiving also um, um, decent no uh, medical treatment and the last but not the least what I want to mention here is the efforts of some members States to use a pandemic to lift uh, the sanctions and uh, I want to remind that it has sanctions have nothing to do with pandemic it has uh, a link with uh, violations of international law and uh, continuing aggressive uh, politics and we should remember that we can only lift the sanctions when uh, the territories are deoccupied and uh, there is a respect to international law thank you mr. president Très gentil. Euh, nous avons maintenant euh, sur la liste Petra Steven. Petra, vous avez la parole. Yes, hello. This is The Hague. And uh, I would say 12 points pour Rick Dams. Uh, it feels a bit like the Eurovision Song Contest, doesn't it? But Rick, I think uh, we have to compliment you as well because you made an excellent statement on the 23rd of April when you emphasize that while we have to deal with these enormous challenges, that COVID-19 brings to our society, we should all be aware not to normalize the abnormal. Or in other words, in my words, the emergency measures to deal with this crisis should not cross red lines when it comes to human rights, democracy and rule of law. And we think here in the Netherlands that as space, we have a very important role to play to prevent this normalization of the abnormal from happening and to protect the values and mission of the Council of Europe. Because, as I have said before, human rights, democracy and the rule of law are not a luxury for good times, but a definite necessity for tough times. And indeed, as uh, Tini Cox has mentioned and others, there are so many horrible things happening to the people all over Europe. But we also see examples of resilience and great solidarity between neighbours, generations and countries. So for the Netherlands delegation, we have three points which we want to uh, clarify that we think should be considered in the upcoming reports and also in the upcoming meetings when we look at the ways we can deal with all these challenges. Number one is the function of functioning of PACE as an organization in itself. How can we continue to work? We're very grateful to the team that has created this innovative ways in the digital realm to be able to discuss with each other. 
uh, but we hope that we can see each other soon in Strasbourg. The second point is the protection of civil liberties of our citizens. We need to look at what is a good exit strategy. How can we enable more freedom of movement, gathering and opening of borders? When and where have states used emergency laws to impose majority rules on minorities? How to uphold the rights of protection of migrants and refugees and the rights to asylum? And what is the assessment of instances of legalized forms of discrimination, racism and gender inequality on, uh, in, in the name of fighting this uh, pandemic? And of course, as uh, colleague Petra Bayer has said, what are the insights of inclusion of groups, exclusion of groups who have no or lesser access to healthcare, information, um, freedom of press, freedom of information? And thirdly, the organization of elections. We hope that the reports will take in uh, the opinions of the Venice Commission. Uh, to conclude, next week on the 5th of May in the Netherlands, we have our National Liberation Day. We will commemorate 75 years of freedom and liberty. And I hope that someday soon, we will be liberated from the horrible effects of the COVID-19 virus while we have been able to protect the human rights, democracy and rule of law in the Council of Europe member states. Thank you. Merci Petra. Le prochain collègue sur la liste, c'est Aki. Aki, vous avez la parole. Thank you, Mr. President. And I also would like to join in the thoughts regarding our health services, all people and uh, health workers from doctors to nurses and everybody who is in hospitals and uh, health uh, organizations that are helping our uh, human uh, fellow humans to live and fight this coronavirus. Um, of course, there is a fine line and we are all part of uh, democratic elected systems. Uh, the Turkish parliament was just uh, open last week and we had our 100 year celebration. By the way, I want to um, I mentioned that here as well, and we are working uh, to go through this crisis. However, of course, uh, again, Turkey was mentioned by some of our colleagues. I'm not going to go into country to country, but to Frank and Tini, I will send a personal letter uh, encompassing all what has been passed in the law and not only what the HTP or the CHP is telling you. So um, I would like to have uh, the opportunity to say that we need information, information, information. But on the other side, we're talking about rights and freedoms for whom? For humans. The fundamental right is to live. And the crisis that we are facing doesn't have any boundaries. Uh, it goes beyond our national boundaries. It goes beyond our even social boundaries. It goes beyond any boundaries that we have. It's a micro microorganism that sets in and may result in, de in death. So we have to be together to fight this. If we start pointing this and that, of course there are issues that we have to look into. Parliaments are important, democracy is important, human rights are important, rule of law is important. However, we have to bear in mind the sacrifices that are being made right now to fight this pandemic. And also on the other side, the important issue is what are the people facing that cannot receive the fundamental health uh, issue, that, uh, health care that, 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 that is their rights? We have to talk about these as well. There are uh, elderly homes that have been left, people have died there. I don't want to bring these up in the first day here, but there are a lot of issues around Europe and, and the world for that matter that we have to address. And of course we have to talk about our rights to travel, our rights to assemble, our rights to protest, but at what cost? This is important. What are the measures going to be? By all means, let, let's, let's, let's have our voices heard. That is the fundamental right of human rights. We have to do this, but what is the price? We have on the other side a very strong health organization, health workers around the world that are trying to save lives. And they are asking us, please don't let people come together in big groups because we will not be able to cope with this. We have to listen to them as well. They have rights as well because they are on the front line. And in, in, in finishing, I would like to say we have to help each other. Turkey has up until now helped 54 countries that have asked for assistance. I think we have to all pitch in together and work together to overcome this. Thank you very much. Merci, Alif. Le prochain, la prochaine intervenance est Zbigniew Rao. Vous avez la parole. Good, good afternoon, uh, Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues. Let me begin with uh, asking all of you to extend my condolences 
to the, to those who have lost their loved ones uh, during the uh, endemic. Uh, in the introductory remarks and then uh, in the debate, many of you were kind enough to express concern about the uh, prospect of the presidential election in uh, Poland uh, these days. Uh, I would like to draw your attention to the fact that uh, under the provisions of our constitution, the presidential election has to be held not sooner than 100 days and not later than 75 days uh, before the um, end of the term of uh, office, which means that the election has to be launched uh, in May this year. What is the alternative to it? The alternative to it is to change the constitution. But to do that, we need uh, to the majority of two thirds. Uh, yeah, two, two thirds majority. So the uh, ruling coalition that I have the honor to represent started negotiations with the opposition forces in order to do exactly that. But we failed because there was no uh, support, in fact, of, uh, no interest on the part of the part of our uh, uh, political uh, partners from the from the opposition. So in this in this situation, we are facing two options. We can we can launch a, a traditional. Uh, uh, the, the, we can we can launch the election in the traditional way, or we can do it uh, use uh, by uh, uh, post, po, post, po, po, postal voting. Of course, none of this solution is the uh, best one. But nevertheless, I would like to draw your attention to the fact that all that is possible. So I, I suppose it would be premature to pass a final judgment on the situation in Poland in this respect. Thank you very much indeed. Merci. Nous avons euh, le, le prochain orateur, Madame Rosa Björk, et je demanderai à Piotr Tolstoy de se préparer pour prendre la parole à, à, après, parce qu'apparemment vous avez été poussé en bas par le système. Je vous demande mes excuses. Donc, Rosa Björk, vous avez la parole. Yes, thank you so much. Hopefully you can see me now. Uh, very good to, to uh, sorry about this. Uh, very good to see you all, uh, dear colleagues. When it comes to responses of the Council of Europe member states to the COVID-19 pandemic with respect to human rights, democracy and the rule of law, we have seen how powerful the Council of Europe is when it comes to assuring and reminding us constantly that even in, and especially in times of enormous crisis, like we've been faced the last weeks, we must uphold and respect human rights and the rule of law. And even when we have all been faced with serious restriction of our freedom of movement or our rights to have an education or social contacts. Um, during these difficult times, we must not forget that this pandemic affects us all differently and can have a devastating effect on the most vulnerable groups in our member states, like marginal groups that are facing depriva deprivation of human rights. Women and children who are faced with higher rates of domestic violence locked in their home, journalists who are faced with restriction of freedom of speech. And we all know that these situations are extremely fragile when it comes to the temptation of many politicians to turn this situation into an autocat and to deprive democratic institutions their rights as well as, as depri deprive of human rights as we have unfortunately seen in Hungary and in Poland and elsewhere as well. I would like to highlight the necessity of parliaments and governments to combating domestic violence with clear and effective measures, with awareness raising, education, educating the public, and by putting more budget into women's shelter, and to ensure access for women and children to hotline and professional help.
Here in Iceland, we have taken measures to support vulnerable groups, work against violence, counteract social isolation among the elderly and disabled, and ensure even more than before that children from low-income families have the opportunity to, to participate in recreational activities. Priority will be given to increased access to mental health service for these groups. But I would as well like to highlight the situation of refugees and migrants. We have a lot of people in detention centers during these times in member states. We have a risk of infection due to close quarters or overcrowding, deteriorating healthcare as the healthcare system becomes overwhelmed, the increased waiting time for relocation. I would like to refer to the statement of the European Committee for the Prevention of Torture, mentioned in the excellent toolkit for member states from the Secretary General of the Council of Europe. The CPT reminds us of our obligation toward persons deprived of their freedom in these difficult circumstances, including in immigration detention centers. And we need to guarantee the continued monitoring of these facilities throughout the crisis. And I would like to especially welcome the initiative of Lord Dundee of the PACE Subcommittee on Refugee and Migrant Children and Lord Dubbs of the OSCE PA Ad Hoc Committee on Migration, who in their letter called on Council of Europe and the OSCE member states to accept to resettle the refugee children now living on the Greek island, islands in inhuman condition. And we need more responses from more member states to this letter. And I also call upon you parliamentarians to back the program set up by the EU Commissioner Ilva Johansson for financing relocation flights for child, child refugees and to urgently intervene with their governments in order to ensure that vulnerable child refugees can be relocated within more of their states. And to safeguard women's rights and children's rights, as I mentioned earlier on, because um, I think it's so important during these times to remember that this is a health crisis that is turning into an economic crisis but we must do anything to prevent that this will become a human rights crisis we have the right tools and means to prevent that thank you and good luck in your work merci je vous ai donné une minute en plus parce qu'apparemment notre système ne fonctionne pas euh, mon cher horst trois minutes c'est trois minutes s'il vous plaît voilà Maintenant, nous avons Pierre Tolstoy. Pierre, vous avez la parole. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Bonjour, tous chers collègues. Euh, J'aimerais bien proposer deux choses concrètes euh, lors de notre débat. La première chose, c'est l'initiative que nous avons lancée avec nos collègues d'une une déclaration qui prévoit à inviter le comité de ministres d'envoyer l'argent économisé par l'Assemblée pour aider les pays et les régions de Conseil de l'Europe les plus touchés par Covid-19, par la pandémie. Cette déclaration a déjà été soutenue par 50 parlementaires de six pays et quatre groupes politiques, et j'appelle tous mes collègues de s'associer. La deuxième, c'est la solidarité dont a parlé Tini Cox tout à l'heure. Et la deuxième chose, c'est que problème de droit de l'homme et de l'état de droit lors de euh, la pandémie de coronavirus a touché tous les pays du Conseil de l'Europe. Et c'est une rare cas quand euh, nous, les parlementaires, euh, nous pouvons, euh, notre préoccupation, transmettre en monitoring des meilleures pratiques ou des mauvaises pratiques dans tous les pays, dans tous les 47 pays du Conseil de l'Europe, pour après comparer les résultats. À mon avis, il faut en profiter et peut-être envisager de discuter une décision là-dessus pour faire un monitoring complexe sur le thème de la lutte contre Covid-19 et les droits de l'homme qui prend à l'ampleur tous les 19 pays. Voilà, et moi je vous appelle à soutenir ça parce que ça c'est les pas concrets qui nos électeurs peuvent constater que l'Assemblée continue son travail et euh, dans le cadre de, de cette situation avec la pandémie. Et donc, euh, pour finir, je regrette le propos de Mme Yasko qui a essayé de politiser le débat. Je vous rassure, chers collègues, que dans les républiques indépendantes de l'Est de l'Ukraine, euh, la situation sanitaire est contrôlée absolument et les médecins qui ont aidé les blessés de, lors de la guerre civile, aujourd'hui aident tous les malades à coronavirus. 
Euh, ce qui concerne la Crimée, évidemment, là-bas, la situation est aussi, même que dans toute la Russie, est contrôlée par euh, les autorités médicales et sanitaires russes et que ces territoires n'ont pas besoin des, euh, de l'attention de nos collègues ukrainiens pour qu'ils s'en occupent euh, de leurs problèmes. Voilà, merci beaucoup pour, euh, pour ce dialogue et pour euh, la possibilité euh, de euh, vous proposer ces deux choses. La déclaration, donc l'argent, et la deuxième chose, c'est monitoring global pour 47 pays du Conseil de l'Europe. Merci, chers collègues. Merci Pierre. La prochaine, le prochain collègue sur la liste, c'est Mme Sniezana Novakovic. Vous avez la parole. Thank you, Mr. President. First, I'm glad uh, that you are all well at this difficult time. Let me share with you my thoughts and experiences in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, because my experiences are very personal. Uh, namely, I and my family members were infected, and now, thanks God, uh, we are well. I'm a doctor uh, by, uh, by profession, which probably made it, made it easier for me to deal with it and better understand the medical point, point of these challenges. Uh, now we are seeing a lot of infected and uh, people dying, and the future is bringing uh, even more challenges. Besides this health crisis, we will face social and economic uh, challenges, This is perhaps the largest crisis since the end of uh, World War II. The virus is new and there is uh, not enough, but, but uh, we know all that when we don't know enough um, knowledge about the threats to health and life, it is often fear that becomes the driver of our behavior, both personally and socially. We need uh, to effectively cure the both, the virus and the fear. The people expect protection of health and life, as well as all other social and democratic values that have been acquired for centuries. That can only be provided through the application of genuine credible knowledge and experience and through well-meaning and open international cooperation. The health system certainly uh, need direct support to provide adequate treatment, but also the public health measures are the most important weapon in the fight against virus now. The measures entail many activities that touch almost all segments of society, including democracy and human rights. In this challenging time, we must not give up on safeguarding all the values of the freedom and democracy and on supporting particularly vulnerable groups. For example, many people who are infected by the virus have experienced condemnation, stigmatization and many embarrassments. On the other hand, Governments are criticized, sometimes because they did not act enough and sometimes because the uh, taken measures maybe have, over, uh, have been overstated. We need as little, pure, uh, as little pure criticism and negative pressure as possible and more exchange of good practices and good ideas. Both human lives and human rights can only be protected by strong, credible institutions implementing measures based on real values, needs, scientific, and professional facts. Let me conclude. The multilateralism has been criticized for a long time as the way of cooperation among countries, but today we see what the significance of such cooperation is. The international standards and mechanisms can be a lighthouse to guide us through, the through this challenging time. This is why we need to take all measures to further improve the work and establish standards, guides and guidelines in, uh, in these or similar situations. Thank you for your attention and uh, I, I want you all the best. Merci. Le prochain intervenant, c'est Joe. Joe, you have the floor. Uh, hello, Mr. President and colleagues. Uh, I would like at the, at the very outset to join in the words of sympathy to our healthcare workers, uh, or rather to our victims and our families, and to salute our healthcare workers. In fact, we used to have soldiers as our national heroes, and it's a wonderful change that our new set of national heroes are nurses and doctors and carers. I think the restrictions applied in most countries and virtually all were necessary to save lives. But our role as the Council of Europe is to ensure vigilance that they are 
got rid of as soon as they become unnecessary as the as the virus moves away or as we get a cure and we get a, a vaccination and i think an inventory should be done by our secretariat of each country of what restrictions they introduce all countries of our 47 countries what precise restrictions they introduced that should be an inventory gathered of that circulated to all our members as objective fact and then we start the monitoring as individuals collectively within our own countries and as a grouping as a council of europe on its own doing and that way there's no the kind of debate that we had a little earlier as to it is the case it's not the case it will be objectively the case and where the measures taken down when not only no longer needed now obviously i'd like to draw attention to a couple of issues that arise in the context of this situation now of course domestic violence is a real contemporary issue now needs monitoring at national at local at every level and by our police forces and there needs to be a vigilance there no matter what restrictions exist mental health issues will arise and do arise and must be looked at and we will have arising from this virus a new poor from economic dislocation that's inevitable in small business etc and that will not return ever so i think we need to be vigilant in particularly our social affairs section with watching for that now there is an upside here and it's the green agenda in that working from home and a, a consequent reduction in travel, a rather in, in the use of cars and public transport, or cars rather importantly, will reduce. And that the green agenda can be advanced, housing problems in our cities can be solved as a consequence if we keep the home working idea there and provide a mental support system for people who could suffer isolation then. I think family solidarity and community solidarity should increase on foot of this and we should build on that so thank you for the opportunity president it's great that we're doing this and at least that we're in a level of contact thank you president merci c'est très gentil le prochain orateur sur notre liste c'est madame dora bakoya dora vous avez le, la parole thank you thank you mr president let me also add my condolences to all those who lost loved ones and my congratulations to our healthcare workers who are really showing the other face of solidarity uh, in all our societies. Mr. President, 2,500 years ago, uh, Pericles was called from the Athenians to make the epitaph for the dead of the first year of the Peloponnesian War. All of you have read what at the time Pericles said. And what he practically said is that uh, we cannot allow our democratic values, our democracy uh, suffer under this big crisis, which at the time was a war. And the truth is that the answer to this crisis can only be the safeguarding of our democracies. Now, the coronavirus is really the biggest challenge modern democracies ever faced. We have never faced this kind of crisis before. And we all know that there are restrictions that, uh, of course, have to be uh, put in place for the very simple reason that they have to protect uh, the people and the health of the people. But there is a fine line. There is a fine line. There is a difference between uh, the, the decision that we cannot have rallies, that the decision that we cannot uh, uh, go all together to some place, the decisions that we have uh, to keep uh, uh, away from each other. And uh, there is a, a difference between these decisions, which, for example, do not allow the freedom of speech which do not allow uh, press liberty or which make a dis uh, difference between um, uh, political prisoners or criminals or uh, elections which are not uh, which are taking place in a uh, wrong environment etc etc i think all of us know the difference between a and b 
And the, the Council of Europe is, has now a very, very big responsibility. And this big responsibility, as you rightly pointed out, uh, already from the beginning of this crisis, is exactly to stand for the values for which we are here. And we are here not to, to lose the argument by speaking about uh, some kind of liberties which we have to, to yes, which we have to, to accept, but for those for which we can do something about it. Thank you very much. Mr. President, microphone. Nous avons, merci Dora. Uh, nous avons sur notre liste encore des collègues. Uh, premièrement, nous avons Madame Maria Jufereva Skuratovsky. I hope I said that more or less right. President and uh, dear voilà. colleagues. Voilà, vous avez la parole. Good afternoon from Tallinn, Estonia. Following the discussion uh, on human rights and rule of law during the pandemic, my point is that this is, must not be tolerated, misuse of power, I mean, and these cases uh, should be detected and uh, definitely condemned. I also wanted to stress that different minorities are in more vulnerable situation in time of different crises, and I want to stress that countries have to pay more attention on informing national minorities in their native languages. I think that Estonia managed well with this as all current information from government and health organizations is available for Russian language minorities in Estonia. So we can be a kind of good example in this uh, regard. And regarding the present situation with the coronavirus in Estonia, our Estonian uh, government uh, decided uh, to extend the emergency situation, which was established until May 1st, uh, due to the spread, spread of coronavirus until May Seven, nine, se, excuse me, uh, 17. The government extended the emergency situation in order to continue to be able to implement effective measures that are still necessary considering the spread and the control of the disease. The measures continue to be justified given that the new cases of infection and new outbreaks are still detected in Estonia. The positive news is that we have seen in the last three weeks the number of new cases of infection and hospitalization decline, and we have clearly reached the peak. This is definitely good news. So the government presented and approved the exit strategy. Then we can also begin to ease restrictions gradually if the medical situation permits. However, since the exit will not take place overnight, but in stages and carefully. Our prime minister, also stress that this does not mean that uh, all restrictions uh, will be all lifted in one time, uh, but uh, some restrictions will be removed early and uh, others uh, will remain in force after the end of the emergency situation. And uh, first, I think uh, the most important step uh, is the restoration of uh, plant treatment this week. And the next steps must be aimed to, to economic recovery in a reasonable and uh, balanced uh, way. And uh, maybe a little bit uh, about our statistics. Uh, in total, uh, COVID cases uh, in Estonia uh, were detected uh, uh, 1,600. In uh, hospitals, uh, now, now they are uh, 75 uh, persons uh, died, uh, uh, 52. And uh, we have uh, made uh, uh, five, uh, uh, 50, 52,000 uh, tests, and among them, 3% uh, of them uh, were positive. Uh, so the situation is uh, stable, but uh, not uh, good for this time. So we're trying uh, to overdue all the situation. Thank you. Merci. Nous avons maintenant comme dernier orateur Davor Stier. Vous avez la parole. Thank you, Mr. President. And uh, regards from Zagreb, actually from the Croatian Parliament, uh, since we had uh, 
today a plenary session and, and a vote in, in plenary. Now to our discussion, I wanted to stress the external dimension of our work because we are all now in, in the world fighting this uh, pandemic. But uh, let's also say that uh, there is also a global ideological competition, if you want, whether are democracies or totalitarian regimes more able to cope uh, with the pandemic. So I believe that our task uh, here is to contribute to project an example that in Europe we can be successful in combating uh, COVID-19 and at the same time to preserve our democratic freedoms. And here, of course, cooperation is needed. And I, I do believe that the Council of Europe and our Parliamentary Assembly is the proper framework for it. So that's what I wanted to stress at this moment. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Nous avons, euh, nous sommes maintenant arrivés à la fin de la liste des orateurs. Je voudrais bien remercier toutes et tous pour votre contribution. Je peux vous informer que, euh, au sein de, de l'Assemblée, nous avons lancé une sorte d'enquête, un questionnaire aux 47 pays afin de nous informer sur la situation actuelle en ce qui concerne les mesures prises par le Parlement, les mesures prises par le gouvernement, la relation entre Parlement et gouvernement, euh, la question sur les, les, les droits de l'homme et les libertés fondamentaux, fondamentales euh, concernant l'état de droit. Donc, cette information est en train de se compiler et une fois plus ou moins prête, elle sera mise à disposition évidemment de tous nos membres et plus, euh, plus particulièrement dans le contexte des rapports que nous pensons euh, devront être, euh, si vous voulez, faites par les commissions dans les semaines à venir. Je remercie donc toutes et tous pour votre contribution et je mets à cet instant fin au débat d'actualité. Grand merci. Nous en arrivons maintenant au point 10 de notre agenda. Autre matière, je ne sais pas, Wojciech, est-ce qu'il y a d'autres matières sur notre, notre agenda Rien du tout Not on my side, unless anyone of members wishes to raise any other business. OK. Uh, Mais je voudrais quand même avoir une clarification, Wojciech, parce que je vois que vous avez la main gauche avec un gant, mais la main droite, vous n'avez pas de gant. Ça, ça, je ne comprends pas. Non, il faudrait me... Ah, OK. Well. Eh bien, voilà. Il est cassé. <rire> bon. Ceci dit, euh, s'il n'y a pas d'autres matières, nous en venons au point 11 de l'agenda, la prochaine réunion. Comme je vous ai informé au tout début de notre réunion et comme je vous ai informé lors du point de l'agenda, nous, nous allons avoir notre prochaine réunion du comité permanent euh, la semaine prochaine, mai, le 7 mai. Nous aurons le bureau de 9h30 à midi. Là, on va traiter le document numéro 20, qui sont donc tous les éléments pratiques de comment gérer euh, les commissions. Et nous allons statué sur les références de rapport au comité. Ceci doit être approuvé par euh, une commission permanente et donc dès lors, à midi, le 7 mai, la semaine prochaine, nous aurons une courte euh, réunion de la commission permanente afin de faire cela comme quoi nous pouvons continuer à travailler comme ils le font en défendant euh, les droits humains, euh, la démocratie et l'état de droit. Je vous remercie toutes et tous de votre contribution. Et j'espère euh, toutes et tous vous voir la semaine prochaine, le 7 mai. Merci et passez encore un bon week-end. Et comme on le dit avec un hashtag, hashtag stay safe. See you next week. Merci. Au revoir. La réunion est close.